So welcome everybody. Um, today Tessa and I are going to be talking about two studies, um, the findings of these studies um, on managed alcohol programmes or MAPS in Scotland. So just a bit of the structure of our talk, um, I'm going to be looking at providing with some background and context. And then I'll discuss the first study um, in terms of methods and findings. And then I'm going to hand over to Tessa to talk about our second study that was conducted um, during COVID, um, as well as some implications and next steps. So just a quick bit about us, um, although Carol's given you a little um, biography. Um, we both are from the Salvation Army Centre for Addiction Services and Research at the University of Stirling. And this was a research centre that's been set up um, since 2017, funded by the Salvation Army to conduct research around addictions. Um, and much of our research focuses on drug and alcohol use, homelessness, physical and mental health and social inequalities. Um, Tessa leads the centre and I'm Deputy Director. And while we're funded by Salvation Army, much of our um, External funding comes from other funders like the National Institute of Health, um, Chief Scientist Office and um, Society for Study of Addiction. So just a bit of background about who we are. So in terms of alcohol use, um, we know that global estimates suggest that alcohol use disorders affect around 237 million people, um, million adult men worldwide and 46 million adult women. And harmful use of alcohol results in approximately 3 million deaths worldwide, which is about 5% of all deaths. And in Scotland, the rates of alcohol use and related harm are particularly high, with more than 1,000 deaths attributable to alcohol in recent years. So we also know that alcohol use disorders are not equitably spread across the population. And some studies suggest that um, there's a mean prevalence among men who are homeless of about um, 38% and also figures for women are less certain. And in Scotland, homelessness affects a significant number of people. Approximately 51,000 um, people were affected by homelessness in 2019 and 2020. And people who are homeless tend to have higher rates of substance use and mental health problems than those who are not homeless. And these problems around alcohol use and homelessness are closely connected to complex social and structural processes and policies, and these create extreme social inequalities, poverty and adverse life events. And alcohol use can be the reason for people becoming homeless, a response to trauma, poverty and difficult life circumstances, and also a way of coping with homelessness. So it's a very complex issue. And we know people who are homeless tend to experience significant harms associated with their alcohol use, including acute harms like alcohol poisoning and seizures, as well as chronic health conditions like liver disease and cancers, premature death, poor mental health, assault and injury, and also inevitable, almost inevitable social exclusion. And access to mental and physical health care services can be quite challenging for this group. So for many people who experience homelessness and um, alcohol use disorders, treatment options are generally quite limited. And abstinence-based programmes are really difficult to comply with because there might be unrealistic or undesirable goals for people. Many people will struggle to access appropriate health, um, treatment services. And when they do, they often have no choice of approach, which results in repeated experiences of detoxification. So in this related um, review that we conducted looking at perceptions of substance use treatment for people who are homeless, and it was looking at international evidence, and we found that participants were generally more favourable towards harm reduction oriented approaches because abstinence based treatment was perceived as challenging, particularly for people who are unwilling or unable to stop using alcohol and or drugs. And harm reduction services are seen as compassionate, non-judgmental um, approaches, but can they also um, participants also recognise the challenges of being in environments where substances are allowed or available if they are wanting to stop using. And we also found um, key con components of substance use treatments for this group, as you can see on the screen. These were things like facilitative service environments, compassionate and non-judgmental support, treatment that was in long enough in duration for people to become stable, and also the importance of formal um, aftercare, having choices about the type of intervention that you receive, 
that, um, and also the opportunity for people to set their own goals with treatment, and also the opportunities to learn or relearn how to live. So skills, learning skills around things like hobbies, computing, cooking, and meaningful activities. So we see treatment as being a very um, holistic approach. And we also recognise that these components need to be delivered within the context of person-centred care, relationships, and an understanding of people's complex lives. So for people who are homeless, there's a lack of evidence regarding more traditional treatments for alcohol use disorders. So there's things like pharmacological treatments and mutual aid, as well as evidence around occasional detoxification and provision of medical support, which can improve long-term um, health outcomes for street drinkers. But there's ex expectation that long-term abstinence is unlikely to be achieved. So we know that the aim of harm reduction is to reduce harms and to meet people where they're at rather than imposing or expecting abstinence. So many treatments, as we've um, I've said, have, for alcohol use disorders do expect abstinence and it can be um, particularly undesired or unachievable for people who are homeless. So we get harm reduction strategies for alcohol, um, including things like teaching people how to drink safely, um, limiting number of drinks, um, as well as other um, interventions that will reduce injury, violence and public disorder. But compared to drug use, there are far fewer options and a weaker evidence base for alcohol harm reduction. So taking this all together, we know that for people who are homeless with alcohol use disorders, access to abstinence-based treatment is challenging and often unwanted or unrealistic. People might not have the desire or practical, so both unethical and impractical if people are expected to go back to living on the streets afterwards. Alcohol. This is the alcohol programme. And MAPS um, provides structured and non judgmental approach to alcohol harm reduction that does more than just educating people about safer drinking strategies. So MAPS are programmes where alcohol is provided in measured regular doses throughout the day as an alcohol harm reduction intervention. Um, as Carol said, they've been developed in countries like Canada as well as Ireland for people who experience homelessness and alcohol use disorders who find it hard to engage with these higher threshold addiction services. And um, in Canada, there are currently 23 managed alcohol programmes across the country with at least 10 have, um, having started in response to COVID. The first map was set up in, Can in, in Toronto in Canada in 1997 in response to three men freezing to death on the streets. So maps are not new, um, they've been running for over 23 years. And they vary in terms of how they operate. So settings can include residential, like hostels or residential um, sh sheltered housing, drop-ins or day centres, and or hospital um, based. In terms of um, people who are on maps, um, generally the services are quite small. Um, some are very small with um, a handful of participants, whereas one in Vancouver has more than 200 people as gender. Many people are um, Aboriginal. Most are funded by government and health authorities. Some have a co-op model where people will pay for their alcohol. Some people pay rent or for their meals. And in some cases, people um, will contribute to the costs of alcohol and in others it's provided. In terms of the type of alcohol, it varies again. Some provide um, a choice of beer, wine or spirits, whereas others might just administer one particular type of alcohol. Administration calls um, hours, and it can um, be by individuals depending on their own drinking plan. Um, in Canada, in particular, some people who access maps do use non beverage alcohol, so drinking things like um, spirit, um, hand sanitizer, or methylated spirits. But it's not just the only focus, and it's particularly um, for people who've got chronic alcohol use disorders and unstable housing. Um, and most of them provide um, not only alcohol and um, housing, but regular activities, healthcare, um, social and cultural programmes, um, as well as assistance with life skills. 
And harm reduction is obviously a guiding principle between the, um, behind these programmes. And um, just to note that maps are generally operating in Canada and the majority of research um, evidence comes from these um, programmes. However, things are changing um, and maps have started to gain prominence across the world. So in Australia, for example, Ezard and colleagues conducted a survey with people in Sydney who would be eligible for a map and found that they were perceived to be as accept um, perceived to be acceptable to them. Um, with um, residential maps likely to produce significant cost savings. And a recent report um, from Canada also recommended a map within the Northern Territory to address the challenges of those, for those experiencing um, homelessness and alcohol use disorders. And then thinking about um, closer to home in Ireland, um, the DePaul charity it runs Sundell House in Dublin, which has been providing a map since 2008 for about 20, uh, 30 people who have histories of entrenched street drinking. Many people have up to 15 years of exclusion from housing and addiction services. And um, in 2010, DePaul produced a report of Sundell House, which showed that about 87% of residents had physical health needs, 40% had mental health needs, and 55% were classed as high alcohol dependence with a small number also using drugs. Many people needed household nutrition and or health and uh, personal care support. Of the 44 people who'd been um, part of Sundell House since 2008, five had died, one had moved on to supported accommodation, two had gone into hospital, four had been excluded for violence, and three had left for other um, reasons. And 17 of these people sustained their accommodation. Most people were drinking 30 units or less per day, although there were 13 people drinking more than 40. And two of them um, reported being alcohol free. And there were successful outcomes reported to some service users, including changing their drink of choice, for example, switching from drinking large quantities of spirits to something lighter like lager or cider, as well as slower drinking and reduced alcohol intake, which had improvements um, to people's health as well as increasing their appetite and reducing behavioural issues. And Sundell has a um, pretty big centre with 23 staff, including managers, nurses, case managers, support workers, chefs, reception staff, catering assistants and cleaners. So we're just going to watch a short video about Sundell House in um, about seven minutes, just so you can get a flavour of what these types of services look like. So my name is Ed Hannan, I'm the Deputy Manager of Sundal House. Um, Sundal House is a housing project that was set up in 2008. Um, the reason it was set up initially was to meet the need of people who would be entrenched to long-term street drinkers. Um, there was a project before here called Angel Street that was an emergency shelter for entrenched street drinkers. And they found obviously as, as people, as the age group and the age profile got higher, the more and more people um, needed a higher level of support. So Sundial House was set up with that in mind. Um, so we have 24 hour cover here. There's a nurse on site five days a week. We have 127 hours of care support for residents because a lot of our residents would need support around their personal care and the maintenance of their rooms. And that kind of one-on-one -on -one support would be needed by, by a few of our residents. The residents here, we, we manage a lot of aspects of the, of the life, of the lifestyle um, to minimize the damage that that caused is causing to the systems. Uh, for example, every resident here will be on an alcohol management plan. So the idea behind alcohol management plan is that before these were in place, you have a situation with residents quite a lot where they would binge drink heavily on a say Wednesday or Thursday, and then would spend, you know, they'd end up going through DT every week, and the physical effect that had on them was obviously huge. So. We sit down with each resident and we kind of we work out a different alcohol management plan so we can spread it out over seven days. Um, it's obviously kind of budgeting as well. So bringing in the alcohol management plans I brought a lot of changes to the shelter and to, to the community in the sense that residents are drinking consistently over a week. So there's more, they're, they're more able to like, liaise with health services and they're more able to liaise with the life skills and the holistic stuff that we have going on in Sundial all the time. Um, the violent or kind of aggressive or behavioural issues are reduced because of the kind of consistent level 
and obviously the physical damage that people are causing to themselves by going to withdrawal every week um, by not going to withdrawal every week, every week means that they that there's a lot, a lot of improvements in, in the kind of nutrition as I said personal care a lot of aspects of a residents lives every resident here would have a key worker so each person has an individual key worker they have then a support plan based around their needs to be drawn up with the key worker. So the support plan will cover a lot of different areas of the care. It will cover personal care, nutrition, budgeting involved in their in their in their care plans and in their care. Um, all the residents here will be in touch with the families, and it is nice to see. I think it's good for the families that they can see that their people that they care about are being looked after. People that they obviously for whatever reason they, they weren't able to manage the behaviours themselves. But I think for a lot of people, it's it's like a sigh of relief for them when the rest of the news is here because they know they're not going to be out drinking in the streets. They know they're not going to be in and out of different shelters and different services. And they know we're going to work with them on site here. That we, we don't exclude people. We work with behaviours. So we people, you know, people are mostly in house. Our residents, the large part, would drink on site. They wouldn't drink in the area surrounding the shelter. So it's good for the local community too. Um, the people aren't drinking on the streets and the antisocial behavior that comes with that and obviously the vulnerability that that poses for a lot of our residents if they would be you know more more vulnerable out on the street to getting attacked and um, so yeah each so the families you can see with families when residents move in here they, they they're delighted that people are actually being looked after um our residents can stay here indefinitely uh, this is a bed for life and um, because that's a, that's a long term housing aspect of it. We have a huge team of volunteers here, which is excellent, that engage the residents. Obviously staff quite busy here with managing the alcohol, managing budgeting, managing medication, personal care and health and safety stuff that obviously they unfortunately probably haven't got as enough time as they would like to sit down one to one with residents. So that's where the volunteers come in very handy. Um, one of the main things that would happen here every day, Monday to Friday would be a breakfast club. Um, the idea with that was to get the residents get to meet together earlier in the day. So what I see as being one of the very positive points of Sundown House is our residents obviously with the low threshold approach to our residents that we work with. These would be people a lot of times who have behaviour problems um, and would have in the past been excluded from a lot of services and wouldn't be allowed to engage with services because of the alcohol use and would have slept out on the street um, would have been engaging only in emergency services very late at night in Dublin we used to have a system called a night bus which used to go and collect people very late at night and bring them to shelters um, but it's, it's very important obviously for the local area and the local community um, that, that we're here because it has reduced the level of street drinking and anti-social behaviour in the area we would meet with community groups we have a, a community guard that would be a police officer that's linked to the shelter so we would, we would talk to him we'd ring him if we have any issues if we think anything it's going to become an issue if we have started noticing any antisocial behaviour you can come in sometimes all he needs to do is say one thing and it kind of can calm down entirely and um, I would be like obviously linked in quite closely with the Dunham City Council and local TDs. That gave you a bit of an um, overview of the types of services included um, within a map. So taking it um, over to Canada and looking at some of the research, um, several studies on maps in Canada have had really promising results. Um, for example, um, Polly in et al. in 2016 conducted a mixed method study with map participants and controls. And map participants were much more likely to retain their housing and experienced increased safety and improved quality of life compared to um, living on the streets in jails or in shelters and hospitals compared to controls. They described maps as a place of safety, characterised by caring, respect, trust, and a non-judgmental approach with a sense of family and home, as well as opportunities to reconnect with family members. Um, Stockwell et al. in 2017 conducted a survey with map, uh, participants in six maps, as well as controls who would, have, um, who would be eligible for a map. And they found that both um, participants had groups of participants had similar um, SEDQ or alcohol use disorder scores and participants who were newer to the map tended to drink more frequently than controls but didn't differ in terms of the number of drinks per day and longer term map participants drank um, significantly fewer drinks per day 
but they drank for more days in the past month than controls and the New Year map participants. So while the overall volume of alcohol was similar, the pattern of drinking was much more evenly distributed across days for long-term MAP participants, um, as well as um, non-beverage alcohol use being higher among the, those who had newly joined a MAP compared to those who had been there for a while or controls. And also long-term MAP residents were less likely to report a, one, any one of 11 alcohol-related harms, including things like um, violence, housing and withdrawal all seizures. So while MAP participants who'd been there for more than two months drank more frequently, they actually drank less alcohol and experienced less harm. So it suggests a smoothing out of drinking for the longer term MAP participants in particular, compared to people who were drinking in more um, intermittent, chaotic ways um, at the beginning. And the change in drinking was also accompanied by uh, significantly fewer acute alcohol related harms like in seizures or being assaulted, as well as social harms like um, relationships, legal, financial and housing problems, as well as improvements in self-related physical health and cognitive functioning. And Tam and Detail in 2016 conducted a cost-benefit analysis of one map in Ontario, and they found that the cost per person of health, shelter and police service utilisation was much lower compared to people's use before they joined the map, as well as controls, um, which is around 13,000 uh, Canadian dollars spent each year compared to about uh, 45,000 um, for those who were um, for prior to the map. And then finally, the most recent study by Stockwell et al in 2021 um, showed that there were reduced harms for people who were on the map, as well as um, when those left people left the map, their liver status tended to deteriorate. So overall, these are just a um, handful of studies and there's many more, but it shows that MAPs can reduce alcohol-related harms, um, improve relationships and quality of life, well-being and safety, as well as reducing alcohol intake and helping people to retain their housing and helping them to feel safer and have opportunities for healing and connection. So alcohol harm reduction is complex and can be um, viewed as ethically challenging because Alcohol is obviously um, a poison that can um, pose significant risk to people's health and safety that are dose dependent. And as alcohol consumption continues, um, when someone joins a MAP, there's a need to recognise that um, while the evidence for MAPs is positive, um, there's um, still the need to assess these long term um, heavy drinking, although Stockwell and colleagues did um, look at this in their latest paper. So that takes us on to um, our first study, um, which was funded by um, the Chief Scientist Office um, and in 2019. And it was a mixed method study looking at um, the uh, feasibility of maps in Scotland. So aimed to scope the feasibility and acceptability of providing maps within third sector um, homelessness accommodation to look at how we might tailor maps to um, a Scottish and UK context. So the objectives were to scope the target population in terms of the people who would benefit from a map, looking at the attitudes of staff working in services, commissioners and strategic decision makers, as well as um, those people who would be eligible for such a service. So the um, study was led by Tessa, along with myself, Katrina Matheson, Bernie Polly and Tanya Brown. Um, and we received ethical approval from the University of Stirling, Salvation Army and Turning Point Scotland. So in terms of the methods, um, it was a mixed method study, first con well, con uh, conducted concurrently. So we conducted a case note review with, um, within seven Salvation Army services and two turning point services across Scotland. And we extracted um, data from 33 people's case notes to look at um, their health and social issues um, and a range of data, including things like alcohol use, housing status, demographic characteristics, physical and mental health, addiction treatment services, and um, other things. These were entered into a spreadsheet and then subsequently analyzed in SPSS. We also conducted interviews with 29 people, so 12 strategic level informants, so generally people in government, NHS, or um, leadership roles within third sector organizations. Um, frontline homelessness services staff, um, eight people, and with nine people who would meet the criteria for a map. 
and we um, looked at alcohol use and the needs of the target population and people's perceptions of MAP. And we used three vignettes to explore the different approaches um, with options around residential, drop-in and co-op models. And these interviews were transcribed um, and analysed using framework method. And additionally, we did a bit of a mapping exercise to look at um, identifying services across the UK that um, operated as maps um, based on the information that we found um, by looking at um, searching on the internet. And we've identified five services across the UK that appear to be operating, at least to some extent, as maps. There are two in England, one in Scotland, which is Rowan Alba's Thorntree Street, one in Wales and one in Northern Ireland. And they were all residential and um, four of them were available to both men and women. And all of these um, services could be considered as drawing on map approaches because alcohol is stored centrally and provided at regular intervals um, and a range of support services were uh, provided. Um, other services exist that um, allow alcohol on site in clients' rooms or in designated areas, but they wouldn't meet the criteria for maps because they're not um, alcohol is not being centrally held. And there's also likely to be many more services that operate as maps but are under the radar. Um, and it's important to note that while Thorntree Street appears to have similarities um, with maps, they don't really view themselves as such. Um, and it's not managed for all clients, only those who need it. And it's also important to note that no evaluations or studies have been conducted in these maps. Um, so this is the first study in Scotland. So in terms of the case note review, we found that um, generally participants were male and aged 30 to 49 years. Physical health problems were reported for 54% of people and almost um, most of them included things like respiratory problems, joint and nerve pain, infectious diseases and so on. 97% of the case notes had um, the presence of mental health problems um, and this tended to be depression or anxiety or post-traumatic stress. And alcohol use, as you can imagine, was incredibly high, um, with everyday alcohol use reported for 26 of the 33 people. Units ranged from 10 to, um, to um, more than 100, um, and wine and spirits were the most commonly consumed types of alcohol. 75% um, of people experienced daily withdrawal seizures um, or daily withdrawal symptoms, and about 15%, uh, 15 people had uh, weekly seizures. Um, about a third had been in previous um, alcohol treatment and about um, two thirds had had previous alcohol detoxes. Um, hospital admissions for alcohol use were um, experienced by more than half, but there was only one alcohol related ambulance call out. And also cognitive related uh, impairments were also reported for 10 people. And also 58% of people use drugs as well as alcohol, um, particularly heroin, benzodiazepines, uh, cocaine or crack cane and cannabis. And we looked at associations between drug use and alcohol use con um, units. And there were no associations between the daily number of units um, and use of heroin, methadone, cannabis, cocaine or benzodiazepines. So from the case note review, our study shows similarities to people accessing maps in Canada who are typically male with high levels of drinking and um, high rates of daily drinking, which suggests the need for maps in Scotland. So I'm going to quickly go over the key themes from the study I'm looking at um, four in particular. So the need for maps. Participants talked about the need for maps in Scotland for those who are experiencing homelessness and alcohol use disorders. And we're clear that these services are uh, typically lacking across the country. They were generally positive about the prospect of introducing MAPS because there's a strong sense that alcohol harm reduction was underdeveloped. And they talked positively about the way in which MAPS could fit into current service provision. So as you can see from the quote on the screen, um, one of the participants um, who used a homelessness service was clear that they would personally benefit from the MAP. They said, um, that they would they would stop drinking um, that it would be beneficial because they might um, by stopping drinking they would go into fits they would be shaking um, so it wasn't beneficial for them to try to stop um, in terms of eligibility 
Um, participants also discussed the importance of being clear about who maps are intended for and the individuals who would benefit from them. And there's consensus across all groups of participants that maps would be best suited to those who've been excluded from other services who are considered disengaged. And the overall view of participants was that individuals would best be suited um, to provision of a map. Um, it would be those who had tried other services and interventions who had not benefited from them or had struggled to keep their tenancies because their dependency was too severe. As you can see from the strategic participant, who says it's presumably the most disengaged to have tried, they probably ping pong back and forward between all sorts of services and they have a real dependency on alcohol. Um, participants also reflected on the potential challenges of providing maps in Scotland where there's high rates of poly substance use. So people using both alcohol and drugs. And that's reflected in the case note findings. And many staff gave anecdotal evidence of clients and residents using benzodiazepines cocaine, cannabis and heroin or methadone alongside their alcohol use and the potential challenges of providing um, um, support to individuals who are using alcohol and drugs within a map. And some potential beneficiaries also talked about their own and other um, poly substance use. And as you can see from the quote from the um, staff participants, they said that um, while most people are alcohol dependent, there's been a massive rise in poly drug use. The classic drinker are also using things like street Valium. So overall, participants were clear that alcohol harm reduction services are needed in Scotland for people who are at high risk of harms due to their alcohol use and their housing. People were clear that maps would be valuable for those who had exhausted all other treatment options and were in need of alternatives. And the high rates of both alcohol and drugs in the um, group was viewed as a particular concern in Scotland that needs to be considered when developing the services. So we also identified six key components of maps that need to be considered in Scotland, and I'm now going to talk about uh, two of them. So as I noted before, maps are more than just providing alcohol, and participants talked about the importance of maps um, in being holistic. There's a recognition of the need to take a holistic approach um, which considers a range of um, aspects of people's lives, like their mental and physical health, housing status, finances, skills development, and meaningful um, social activities. Healthcare um, was mentioned by many, um, with some participants view, have, having the view that a nurse or GP should be on site to deal with um, the many physical health problems. Um, but others saw that actually it'd be important for people to in, and engage with mainstream health services, which would, could encourage the um, independence. And all participants viewed the provision of social activities within MAPS as important, as a way of reducing boredom and social isolation, as well as building self-esteem and developing relationships. And you can see from the three quotes from um, strategic staff and potential beneficiaries that doing something um, would be really important within a MAP. And then finally, um, in thinking about autonomy and rules, when we presented three different types of maps to um, participants, um, they discussed the need for a balance between service rules and individual people's autonomy. So in one of the vignettes, alcohol was provided um, every 90 minutes, as it has been, um, as it is in some of the maps in Canada. Um, and people have to stay on site an hour beforehand to get um, their alcohol. So some participants were concerned about the rigidity of this approach and felt that flexibility in rules and structure was required. And a strate strategic participant noted um, that people might find these rigid rules really hard to stick by. And participants also talked about the need for people's um, autonomy in terms of like money provision, um, particularly around purchasing alcohol. And participants um, who were potential beneficiaries discussed the benefits of MAPS um, in in supporting people's budgeting and working with them to identify how much money could be spent on alcohol. And they described experiences themselves of services where money is managed by staff to support their budgeting. And as participants said, if it's got a good structure, that could be um, a good thing. Some people like structure, um, it might be difficult to start off with in terms of structure, but it can um, be a good thing and people would get into the swing of things and start to be involved more. So participants highlighted the need for support for people accessing maps in terms of encouraging autonomy, 
providing opportunities for people to make their own decisions, to build self-efficacy and self-esteem, and the importance of ensuring that people were in control of their support. So I'm now going to hand over to Tessa to talk about um, our second study. Thank you, um, Hannah. Yep, yeah, we have. We were fortunate enough to have another um, set of funding from Chief Scientist Office for Scotland, which was part of the Rapid Response Programme in response to COVID nineteen to inform health service delivery as part of Scotland's response to the pandemic. And um, so there was two main research questions here, which I'll let you read. Um, but really, that was about applying what we'd learnt in the initial MAP study um, to the pandemic and um, the implications of maps for uh, further delivery in Scotland. Thanks, Hannah. Okay, so this is our study team. So pretty much the same team with some, some more folks added because this was a study that had to be done in six months. So we really had to get our skates on to get the work done within that period, um, which was really challenging, but we, we managed it and we had a brilliant team of researchers and supporters through our study steering group as well. Um, no conflicts to declare again for this study. Thanks, Hannah. So the methods, we use similar methods to the ones we uh, developed for the first study. So another case note review, this time uh, we managed to secure case note rec records for, for 12 people. Again, looking at some of the sim similar things that we'd looked at before uh, and entered into the spreadsheet in a similar way. Um, again, we did an interview, semi-structured in-depth interviews with a range of uh, um, different groups from the ex external stakeholders and the numbers of their service managers who are delivering uh, services within Salvation Army and I should say that the study this time um, was just a, um, a study within the Salvation Army services in Scotland. We wanted to speak to frontline staff who of course very challenged at that particular period of time so that was last May and, and, and into um, September during the pandemic, the early weeks and months of the pandemic and also people who would potentially be beneficiaries of a map if it was implemented. Um, so we were exploring, as I said, some, some of the similar issues around maps, but definitely in the context of, of delivery in a, within a pandemic. Okay, um, I'll, thank you very much, Hannah. Um, just to say, we also commissioned a series of, of paintings from a wonderful artist called Linda McGowan, who's um, based in Glasgow, and um, we worked with her another, on another project where people might remember some of her art for us um, Scottish University's Insight in Institute uh, program that we that we ran collaboratively with other institutions. So Linda's part of the Unexpected Gallery, which is a social enterprise based in um, St Enoch Centre in Glasgow, and Linda and her gallery manager Stu Duffy were were the artists, kind of artists in residence for this pro project. So the reason we had the art as part of it was recognizing that it's very challenging in the pandemic circumstances to, of course, collect data. Um, one one member of our team did manage to collect some face to face data with clients, but just about everything was online, including our meetings and discussions about the study. So this was an attempt to create visual images as part of the project to, 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 in a way, track some of the process of doing the research itself, as well as the themes. This was a really successful element of the project, and we've been to show some of our paint of Linda's paintings um, through the, the rest of the talk. Because of the volume of quality of data as well, I should say that for this particular presentation, we're just going to be focused on um, the COVID-related findings. There's another wealth of um, findings that we're going to be presenting possibly in the future and, and preparing for another paper which is more uh, about the implementation challenges and building on the work in the other studies so we're only um, presenting one main theme and sub themes thanks Hannah okay so this these are our findings from the case note review and we're kind of going through really quickly but very very similar findings unsurprisingly although of course this was just within one organization um, in Scotland, but um, three, I think three or four services we were collecting case notes from um, clients. So again, most people we were collecting kind of case notes from were, were men. Uh, and you can see here huge numbers of people, although there was only 12 overall, the majority experienced physical health care problems, 100% mental health problems, 50% use alcohol every day with most drinking at least 20 units per day. 
92 percent have been drinking for more than 20 years and audit scores were really high um, ranging from 14 to 36 with a mean score of 30 so certainly many many people the majority were would have been um, um, diagnosed with alcohol dependency and alcohol use disorders 100% of that small sample reported daily withdrawal symptoms. So when we're thinking about risks of seizures and, and other harms, you know, very much um, high risk uh, individuals, 58% reporting seizures. Most of the previous um, experience of, of alcohol use disorder treatment, detox and hospital related um, admissions. Um, but frequently, as, as Hannah was saying, this ping pong effect of going in and out uh, and, uh, and then back into street, street living um, as well. 67% of people had alcohol related cognitive impairments and per perhaps very surprisingly for this audience, perhaps 100% um, of that sample of 12 also was, were using drugs, illicit drugs, street drugs, um, with with 58% of that using multiple of that sample using multiple drugs. We also gathered information about COVID. That was something very different from the case note review that we did before. Um, and and one, only one out of 12 um, people had experienced COVID-19 symptoms and been tested. And one person had been shielding, and for those outside Scotland, this was um, people that were recommended by our health service to, to protect themselves. Um, uh, with physical distancing and stay at home. Everyone was told to stay at home, but they were put in the different categories because of their health condition and, and were told to shield. Uh, and nine, nine of the 12 people actually broke lockdown rules in terms of what was recorded in the notes anyway to consume, consume alcohol. So I've rattled through that. There are a few other high level findings there. For example, we were interested in, in non-beverage alcohol use so that's one of the risks, certainly in Canada uh, and other places when people can't get access to illicit alcohol. Um, but we didn't have anyone reporting NBA use, as it's called. Um, so, again, it's really just to paint a picture of people's complex needs. And we know people have multiple and complex needs, but this was one way of us sort of tracking that through the notes that were being taken. And of course, lots of things, particularly in, in the pandemic, weren't recorded because certainly Salvation Army staff were prioritising relationships, building trust and ensuring engagement with the people that were using their services. So it's just to say that this is probably um, underreporting many of those, of those so certainly the COVID-related activities. Thanks, Hannah. We can go forward onto the interview findings. So um, again, a bit of a whistle-stop tour through our interviews. We're writing up at the moment for a pu publication certainly submission to a journal that's um, a special issue looking at health and homelessness. So as I said, one major theme of our qualitative data related to COVID, unsurprisingly, given that was our, our um, one of our main focuses and aims for the study. Uh, and then there were five sub-themes related to this, and I'll take them, take you through those one by one. Thanks, Hannah. So the first theme or sub-theme from the interviews was COVID-19 related changes to services. So here's some quotes, one from Soak Soakholder and one from client potential beneficiary for you to have a read of. So inevitably the pandemic changed the way in which substance use and homelessness services could support clients. Obviously since indoor one-to-one -one support was no longer feasible due to the restrictions. So there was a necess necessity of service adaptation to fairly instantaneously, um, although very challengingly, uh, and many services responded in creative, innovative ways. And this was a, a case across the board, of course, not just within Salvation Army services, which we were focused on. So many services were moved online, which many of us already know. And some of this worked really um, effectively to broaden the number of people who were able to get support um, and many um, solutions uh, and approaches were kind of sped up because of the, the pandemic. Some of the clients experienced the change uh, to be limiting support, but, but others um, talked about the benefits. And this uh, quote here was about somebody who actually felt that um, the pandemic had, had brought benefits in terms of engagement. So they're saying it's actually quite good compared to the past. I never used to really engage with some of the services. So I think the stepping up of harm reduction services more generally, although those were mostly around um, homelessness in general uh, and around illicit drugs. Um, some of those benefits were, were felt by some of the people we were speaking to. 
Some people that we spoke to talked about a massive, massive shift in organizational cultures. Some people talked about it as a curveball uh, in terms of thinking about um, moving from absence related um, provision um, for people who had alcohol problems to, to harm reduction, just because that's really not necessarily been the culture of services in Scotland thus far. Um, so yeah, it was very challenging uh, and many of our stakeholders and, and service uh, providers talked about some of those, those challenges, but also some of the benefits of so one of the managers, for example, said, this is to save a life that would be in terms of providing alcohol. It's the same as providing someone with naloxone. So talking about the kind of scale up of naloxone response for people who use drugs and a risk of overdose. So in summary, in terms of this sub theme, participants reported that services responded quickly, flexibly, and really collaboratively and creatively in response to challenges introduced by COVID-19 pandemic. There were relaxed rules regarding absence in accommodation, for example, and these expedited entry into substance use treatment sometimes as well. The two curated paintings we put for you to have a look at were created by Linda to depict the COVID-related changes to these services, in particular the increase in outreach services. So thanks, Hannah. We'll just um, show the audience the first and the second. So this is one that Linda did very early on. And there was a series of 10 creative paintings, and this is the, the first one that she's done, and the second one really about that street outreach it's not the whole painting, obviously. And just to say, for those who want to, want to know more about the paintings, we're going to hopefully, once restrictions ease in Glasgow, have these paintings um, uh, put on in, in, a, in a gallery for public access, uh, along with some of the findings of the, the study. Thanks, Hannah. So our next theme was, uh, sub-theme is changes to alcohol supply and use. So you can have a look at the, some of the um, quotes here, but uh, we were trying to get a picture of where the alcohol use went up, went down, say the same. And many people we spoke to talked about it being a mixed picture. Some people described the escalation um, in, in individuals having problems with alcohol use and that uh, the relationship with substances had been exacerbated over the time, whereas others have uh, pulled out the issues around begging and not having access to funding which um, for, for alcohol, which I know has been picked up in other studies. I know that that's um, something that we've been keeping an eye on too. Some others have said that, that the opportunity of the pandemic helped people to stem their drinking, really thinking about the decisions that they had in front of them. So, yeah, I mean, even though our, 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 our sample was fairly small, we did have a lot of diversity that, that we managed to capture. Um, in, this, in the interviews that we had. In summary, participants felt that for some people, um, actually uh, alcohol reductions, um, sorry, I just wanted to make a point about um, alcohol uh, as well as drugs. So significant risks around alcohol with, with related to withdrawal because people were not getting access to alcohol in the same way. Um, and a key finding, I think, for us was around um, illicit juice, uh, drug use as well. And many of our participants talked about people substituting alcohol with illicit drugs, including benzodiazepines, and um, that they were um, additionally at risk for that reason, for, um, for a range of drug-related harms as well, including overdose. Um, so there was, this was clearly also linked to isolation. I just want to ask Hannah to go on to the next slide as well. I think we've got another. Um, painting here um, depicted by Linda, but just really wanted to underscore the, the issue that clients and staff assistants raise around social isolation, which is really a theme of many of the studies that have been done around people who use drugs, but it was very much a, um, a feature of this study as well, unsurprisingly. Thanks, Hannah. So on my next sub-theme, uh, is alcohol, people with alcohol problems being viewed as second-class citizens? Um, this was a, a shocking, but quite unsurprising um, finding for us in some ways, given the work we've been doing in this field and others as well. And um, so the stakeholder participants talking here, what we found was that at the start of COVID, alcohol services were an early casualty of COVID. We had many reports of alcohol services diminishing very quickly. Uh, and there were examples of alcohol facilities being used for other purposes and drugs being prioritized ahead of alcohol. So again, some of the similar themes with this study that, we, that Hannah presented on, um, but yes, uh, this was a feature um, that, that some of the nonprofit sector were trying to, um, to, to take up 
uh, the contacts that were lost in terms of statutory NHS services. One of the clients, for example, said, I'm going to have to wait months and months and months and months down the line before anything gets done. So it's just a roller coaster. Uh, and another stakeholder said the advice that we were given by and large was to continue on alcohol. It's not safe to currently detox you. We can't put the time and support in around you. You're going to be socially isolated. This isn't a good time to do detox. So the painting next, thanks very much, Hannah, um, was created by Linda to show the range of emotions and feelings experienced by people and particularly clients of the homelessness services during the pandemic. Um, overall, there was a view that the availability, therefore, of alcohol services had diminished during the pandemic, resulting in reduced support and increased isolation due to stay at home rules. This had reinforced the view of some alcohol services, uh, that alcohol services were perceived as less important. Now, our role isn't to, to emphasise drugs or alcohol. It's really just to, to, to give you that perspective from participants that they felt that, that um, alcohol um, service users were, were, were not, not receiving the, the, the services that they needed to. Thanks, Hannah. I'm going to move on to um, two further sub-themes. Uh, you've been listening really well, and so we've got some more to continue to say. Um, I'll, we'll come back to some of the points in the chat here. So potential for maps in the context of COVID. So this is, I guess, the, the bread and butter of the study, really. So a couple of more quotes here. Really, over, overall, huge support for maps. We were speaking to a very different group. Most uh, We were keen to talk to different people than we talked to in the first study. It was really the case that many, in a way, people felt that the COVID um, response required uh, maps, and it was really an important um, service development. However, I need to say that they weren't developed. They were not developed in Scotland. Uh, and I think for the paper that we're just trying to pull together at the moment, it's really important to highlight that even though the case is so strong, um, we haven't managed to, to create a, a map in Scotland related to COVID, although, of course, I know that Lorraine's on the call, Lorraine McGrath from Simon today. There, it, there have been plans for con considerable amounts of time for a map in, to be provided in, in Glasgow, which we're hugely supportive of. But there's, there's a need for it in many cities, in my opinion. So here's a few quotes just to support the case again from clients um, and stakeholders. So again, across you know, um, transmission, risk of infection, um, the benefits of, of, of a map there. Um, let's just go to a couple of other things. So, yeah, I think it's important to say that with the quantitative data we've reported to you as well, it's clear that maps would prevent people, if you're supplying alcohol to people within their accommodation, then you're going to stop the need for people to have to leave the premises to secure alcohol or, for example, the substituting drugs as well, to leave the premises. And I know from anecdotal evidence as well that the police were sometimes picking people up and didn't really have anywhere for people to go um, because they were quite often the only people that were actually were out and about on the streets um, for, for, for reasons of substance use. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of some obvious links there just to, to, to reiterate. Um, but what we've also said in the presentation is the importance of maps providing other support and engagement with other elements of services. And I think that's really important. It's not, not just about the alcohol. Um, one stakeholder, for example, talked about how maps could reduce the isolation concerns that we've just been speaking about and provide meaningful relationships, interactions, activities going on, compensating for what we're taking away, being really aware of all the things that were being removed from that, from that client group at the same time. So the paintings that are coming next illustrate the finding that maps are not just solely about alcohol, but also about reducing isolation and barriers to healthcare and treating people with respect and dignity. Thanks, Hannah. Here we go. See there, that's one of my most favourite paint paintings that Linda did uh, of that sense of, of community and interaction. And the next one, thanks, Hannah. So with growing awareness of the need for better harm reduction relative to alcohol, participants spoke about how the pandemic presented a, a, an opportunity for MAPS to be implemented as part of national and, and local citywide wide responses. They talked about the fear of COVID-19 and how, how that had brought a sense of urgency to the table that wasn't there before. They said, I think it will save lives. We're going to give it a go. 
Um, unfortunately, it's not there, not happened yet. But of course, we're not out of COVID and there's plenty more opportunities to continue. OK, thanks, Hannah. So I think this is my final uh, sub theme. So this is the concern. So of course, there are a lot of fears and concerns that Hannah's already talked a bit to. And the service managers really speaking to that moment in time early in the pandemic and get back into that, that period around, let's say, May, June uh, last year. People in this moment of time, we're talking about a map within this framework. People are feeling really safe, unsafe. People are feeling really unsafe at the moment in general. One of the biggest barriers is going to be that feeling of safety. That's for staff and also safety for clients and beneficiaries. But basically, people's sense of vigilance is going to be really heightened. And um, the idea that you're not that you're giving the thing that you know is causing harm to the person to not cause them harm. It can seem nonsensical. Why would you do that? If that's causing the damage, why are you going to give it to them? But this was a proponent of maps, and it's just thinking about the conversation that needs to happen with staff. Uh, the guidelines that need to be put in place um, to address either these these cultural differences and some of the also some of the hoops around licensing uh, and uh, inspection regimes and things too, which I know that Simon and um, community have been um, in, in, engaged with for considerable amounts of time. So what we're not saying is that it's easy. We're not saying it's straightforward. Um, to bring people alongside you and some people also spoke about the need to take communities and neighborhoods uh, people uh, residential communities along alongside as well in terms of doing a bit of a PR job for for maps for this wider accept acceptability so moving on to our implications so thanks we've just covered two of those studies and this is our final couple of slides really on the implications for policy and practice, which are huge. And many of the, the, these you'll, you'll know already, and I hope you can read this more writing, but there's a number of, of implications for, from both studies, and we'll put them together on, on one slide for you. So we believe um, maps are required in Scotland as a harm reduction approach to managing alcohol-related harm. And there's been some comments in the chat around, well, are they just for people who are homeless? Generally, yes. Um, but people can quite often be at risk of homeless and be, you know, bounced in and out of um, short term home, homelessness accommodation and then maybe longer term, but they still may be at risk of homelessness. So it is really an approach for people who are homeless, but um, it's also, I think, important for people who are more, more broadly vulnerable to homelessness. The maps need to be taking into account the high risks of poly substance use and mental health problems, physical health problems, as you've seen there. Uh, from the case note reviews that we've done, um, it's not just about alcohol, it's really about joining up a whole range of services that people, if they're not in stable accommodation, they just can't access. We believe that maps should be tailored to local and individual needs, so they would, would be different. I mean, Sinead's just put a comment in the, the chat around the Aberdeen service and, and, and Glasgow service, that we need to be tailored to, to the cities as well as individual organisations and individual needs. I, I certainly think that we could be looking at residential and also drop-in settings, but of course that brings a range of challenges, particularly in COVID and the pandemic. Some of our findings um, coalesce with other studies we've done around the need for staff to be well-trained, compassionate um, and non-judgmental, including having a good, strong engagement from, from peers and people with lived experience. I think I've already said they should be more than about just alcohol and they should be helping people access a range of health and social care supports as well, including, as we just heard from the Irish um, map, the Dublin-based map around family and um, family re-engagement, which I think is a really, really important component of maps. And it's been written about in, in the Canadian studies. Maps should present an, an opportunity for, yeah, they absolutely present a, an opportunity for, for Scotland in terms of the COVID pandemic, but they need to be continued to be tested and evaluated. So I think, and our team thinks that we need to be looking at feasibility and pilot studies next focusing on client outcomes. Thank you, Hannah. So we just put a few pieces of, of knowledge dissemination, knowledge action, knowledge and action work that we've been doing, including publications and also a piece for the conversation. And Hannah's done some a COVID related bike size lecture as well, if you're interested in learning more. And our last couple of slides around acknowledgements. Very, very thankful to Chief Scientist Office for funding both studies. Uh, we're hoping to do a, a bigger, more ambitious study just in terms of actually supporting services to, to evaluate maps in practice. Uh, and a big thank you to Carol and others who are on our M3 um, research advisory groups 
the strategy group, I don't know if anyone's here from that, from Salvation Army, that really we worked as partners in, in doing that second COVID-related study. A huge thank you to Linda and Stu for bringing the work to life and helping us to disseminate, hopefully when we're allowed to do that in person, and of course to our participants at all levels. For more information, we've put some, some um, hyperlinks there for you, but we're very help, happy to, to, for you to be in touch if there's anything else you wanted to know about the study, and we've got time now to take some questions. Thanks very much. <laughs>